So good evening. We'll go ahead and get started now since we're hitting that 6.30 plus. Um, thank you all for coming this evening. This is the first in what will be five events, broadly stated over the next year in celebration of the bicentennial of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Um, I'm gonna give you a little bit of background and then we'll turn our panel loose for you to enjoy their insights and their experience in acumen. But briefly, Tonight's inspired by Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. My guess is that a number of you may have seen a film, but the odds of all of you having read the novel are probably slightly smaller. So 200 years ago, roughly, on a cold and stormy cold summer, uh, Mary Shelley was part of a competition, ghost stories. She, her then lover and soon-to-be husband, Percy Bysshe Shelley, George Gordon, Lord Byron, her half-sister, Claire Claremont, and, oh yes, um, Byron's doctor, John Polidori, all engaged in a competition to write ghost stories. The cut is only Polidori and Mary finished their stories. Polidori's was a vampire, roughly modeled on, gee, Lord Byron. Mary's, on the other hand, she had trouble with. She had a hard time starting it until she had a nightmare. And I won't describe the nightmare, but the result was a five-page short story that, when Byron read it, he dismissed it. Just kind of fluff in their terms. But Percy, on the other hand, found that there was something here. There was something that really struck at him, the imagery. And he encouraged her to turn it into her first novel. This said, she was 18 at the time she wrote this. The novel came out initially anonymously in March 11th of uh, 1818. And she didn't actually get credit on the cover until it was released in the second edition in 1823. At the time, taking advantage of a great popularity in a stage version of the story. Any of you who are familiar with the films, by the way? It was the stage version that added the character of Fritz, who later becomes Igor, in terms of the humpbacked lab assistant. But in any case, tonight what we want to do is not look at the creation of the monster in terms, or I'm sorry, I apologize, the creature, as a combination of human remains and parts that are stitched together and reanimated by lightning. It's instead the idea that Mary looked at this, well, I'm sorry, I've got notes, I'm going analog and old school for a conversation about artificial intelligence, but we have the creature. Mary cast this as, so Victor Frankenstein in the novel there's not a great deal of description about how he does this. He essentially goes mad. He goes manic and is just driven to do a thing that he has figured out the magic element. He, he knows how to create life. He knows how to animate life. So he runs night after night, stay in his lab, putting things together, running off and down to carnal houses, the stray crypt, whatever it takes to get the parts that he needs to create this creature. This, con this construct of his. But after the lightning comes, after the creature opens its eyes, Victor recoils in horror. He runs away, oddly enough, only as far as his bedroom where he collapses into a fever eventually, but he leaves his creation at the time not vocal, not truly coherent, innocent, but slowly becoming aware. The creature leaves. Victor runs away the next morning. The creature is left to somehow get out of the city and into the woods, but we'll leave that aside. But it wanders about. It's innocent and initially generous. It meets a family that it starts to leave gifts. We won't talk about stalkers at this point. But it's only when he introduces himself to that family that, again, they recoil in horror. He's ugly. It's, it's a response to his appearance, and he's confused, hurt. This is compounded later when he's again chased from a village. At every instance, when he encounters humanity, it's repulsed. It drives him off. So the creature, understandably, seeks revenge. He happened to have Victor's notebook, his lab notes, his journal, how this happened, gave him an idea of how to go find Victor. So what the creature does is not stalk Victor, but stalk his friends and family, gradually isolating Victor, leaving him as alone as the creature had been upon birth. And then there's a chase scene that ends in the Arctic, but the important note is that 
The turning of the creature to kill its creator is something that science fiction writer Isaac Asimov coined as the Frankenstein complex in one of his Lost Little Robot stories. That was the title in 1947. This theme has been replicated, reproduced, and has spawned of hundreds of variations over the past 100 years. But Asimov's complex, as he coined it, he in particular started this as a warning not just about automation, about robots, about artificial intelligence. It had a second warning in it, and that was the unthinking or even callous replacement of human labor with automation. Very trenchant in the 1950s and 60s as automated factories were coming in. But where we take this tonight is through popular culture, this has spiraled into fear of frankly, almost all automation, artificial intelligence, mainframe computers, take your pick, whether it be the Skynet from the Terminator franchise, still going strong after almost 20 years, um, the Terminators themselves, cyborgs without a trace of humanity and controlled by program, you know, programming and algorithm, or even the more human, uh, HAL 9000 of 2001 that is driven mad by conflicting orders. We can look more recently, any of you who are watchers of HBO and are familiar with the series Westworld, and the perversion in some respect, or the lack of ethics involved in creating a human android for purely pleasure, for servicing humans. Part of the warning that Asimov gives us is to consider the ethical constraints that need to be involved in creation, not just of life, but that which may cause us to redefine life. How do we plan ahead? How many of you watched an automated Uber drive by sometime in the last few days? Where does some of this innovation go? It's not all about accidentally slipping up and having commercially driven science create a hmm, genetically modified dinosaur. Those are pretty blatant threats. But how we change our habits, how automated bots on the web will alter us, alter our voting, alter our perception of each other. Many of us have probably gotten into arguments with an automated entity at one point or another. Programmed by humans for now, but with something called the singularity that Werner Vinge posited back in the 1990s, at some point there's the possibility of artificial intelligence growing so sophisticated that it bootstraps itself and designs that which we don't even comprehend anymore. If we're lucky, this leaves us behind. If we're unlucky, it steps on us like ants. But on that note, I'd like to introduce you for your panel tonight. <laughs> we have, going from my left and moving over, uh, David Danks, who is the, sorry, L.L. Thurston Professor of Philosophy and Psychology and the head of the Department of Philosophy of the Dietrich College of Humanities and Social Sciences. We have Barry Lucala, who is the teaching professor and director of the undergraduate physics laboratories in the Department of Physics here and the Mellon School, or sorry, the Mellon College of Science. Molly Wright Steenson joins us from the School of Design. She's Associate Professor and Director of the Doctor of Design program. And not least and last, Jeff Bingham. He joins us from the, let's see, the Human Computer Interaction Institute and the School of Computer Science. He, uh, he too is an Associate Professor. Thank you very much for joining us this evening and thank the rest of you. I'd also like at this moment to thank the Dean of the Libraries, Keith Webster, and the Alumni Association for letting us put together this event for you this evening. So let's start. The first question I have for you, let's try it with something, a low ball. <laughs> Barry, in terms of physics, in terms of materials engineering, where do we stand in terms of creating an artificial intelligence that could launch nuclear Armageddon like Skynet, or <laughs> perhaps take over all of the satellites and unleash just a modern technology blackout? Low ball, huh? <laughs> okay, um, I'm going to deflect the question by saying that is not a material science question, <laughs> nor is it a physics question. That, that's really a, uh, a machine learning, artificial intelligence kind of a thing. So it, it's levels above physics and material science. If you can get a system that is 
smart enough to be aware of its surroundings and learn all the intricacies of nuclear weapons and international relations. Um, that's not physics. That's, uh, that's way above physics. And are we there yet? I hope not. I'd accept that. I mean, I was aiming this more toward, well, with the, the current information retrieval capacity and processors, maybe even just information storage. You know, are we looking at technology advancing enough that we can develop? I mean, this requires algorithms. This requires the work of all of you coming together for something to be created that could do this. Not even going into the political relations. Odds are all it needs to do is read Facebook to launch a missile or two. But what would you say in terms of human cognition then, or approaching human cognition? David, do we, are we gaining the, the beginnings of an understanding of what it would take to simulate human intelligence, much less create one? Uh, I think that that's a, that's a tough question. Um, and it's, it's tough because what's happened in AI and machine learning over the last 30, 40 years actually kind of mirrors what psychology has done over the last 120 which is there's been a turn from trying to explain the whole intelligence or construct what in the 70s and 80s was called artificial general, artificial general intelligence, AGI. Um, and in the, in the 90s and 2000s, AI sort of took certain steps forward precisely by no longer trying to do the general thing, by stepping back and saying, let's do, take one very clear, very focused task and optimize on that. So you get AlphaGo created by Google DeepMind, which is unbelievable at playing Go, and at the end, you know, can beat the, the best human player in the world. And at the end of the match, the human player gets up, goes home to his wife, cooks dinner, and does all these things that, you know, whereas AlphaGo gets turned off. Um, and so this sort of divide and conquer approach that I think we've taken in AI over the last 20 years mirrors what's happened over the last 100 years in psychology and cognitive science which is divide and conquer. So let's understand vision. Just, just understand how a human eye can recognize, or human eye plus visual cortex recognizes a chair, which is already an unbelievably difficult task. But we can start to figure that out. And speaking as both somebody who does AI and somebody who does cognitive science, the hope in both disciplines is that at some point we're gonna be able to just kind of glue everything back together. Right, that will get general intelligence by gluing together all of these local understandings. And I think one of the things we've learned in the last uh, 100 years in psychology is that's unbelievably hard. So I think sometimes it's easy to get misled by success at things like Go, or even occasionally driving for about five minutes on a sunny day on a nice, clean Pittsburgh street, and losing sight of all of the other kinds of tasks that we can do as humans, um, so I think the worry is, is much less about having AI that, that reaches human level intelligence, and I would suggest it's much more about us mistakenly thinking that AIs that are not nearly human level actually are, and we delegate authority and power to them that perhaps we shouldn't, given that they aren't yet at our level. Okay. Is there anything the rest of you would like to add to that? Could I? Um, one of the things I think that brings to mind is the notion of modeling. AI is always about the models that we have, and Frankenstein is about someone modeling an intelligence and even needing to make it eight feet tall in order, because that was, that was the level of fidelity, that was, that was the level of fine grain, which is to say quite coarse, um, that was available at that time to the creator, right? Um, and over time, our notions of these models change. The funding for certain models uh, works for a while, and then it doesn't. Microworlds being being one, so certain a certain kind of modeling works until about 1974, and then that's no longer funded, right? Um, but I, I think that that's an important question here: is what are these models that we build, and how do we see them work, and then? eventually expire only to be replaced by something else. Yeah, I guess the, the only thing I would add is it's kind of tempting and interesting to think of these AIs that are these separate, all-encompassing general intelligences, and that's someday in the future, and it's really fascinating to imagine what that might be like. I think what we're dealing with right now and what is really worrisome to me is, is this idea that we're already kind of dealing and working with these AI systems um, 
all, already as individuals, as, as groups. You know, we meant, you mentioned social media, right? I mean, there's all kinds of algorithms, kind of AI, not always AI, um, that are influencing our behavior there, but they're influencing our behavior in all kinds of arguably even more important things, right? So to the extent that an insurance company uses an algorithm to help inform the analyst that makes decisions, the extent, to the extent that a hiring manager does the same thing, you know, so Equifax can't even keep our data, but somehow they have these secret models that are um, informing who has credit, who can get credit or doesn't, and as somebody who is affected by these, these decisions that these models are making, we don't necessarily know to what extent the model influenced that, you know, the extent that the human influenced that, and probably at the organization level, it's not always clear probably to the people who are making the decisions how much influence machine learning statistics had in the decision process versus the humans, um, or how much you would want each, each of those parties to have. So let me extrapolate from this. If we, if we limit it to the idea of not one overwhelming artificial intelligence, not something like an Ultron, or maybe something closer to a Skynet, where, okay, it was modeled on a mainframe computer in the 80s, and it had a very distinct mission, control nuclear weapons, prevent the Soviets from bombing, react. So it had a more constrained set of responses and actions that were available. If we look at something along these lines as these more limited systems or expert systems, then how much of this, let me restate that, if we look at it as models, how do we begin to approach looking at the interrelation of models? So you mentioned the eye recognizing a chair. So it goes through a process, first that's geometric and then analogy I'm assuming in terms of what you know, what can be used or what can be done with these surfaces and runs down through probabilities to figure out, okay, this most likely is used for that. Um, I don't even know how to ask this. <laughs> the design is where I'm thinking with this first. Well, I'll, is, I'll, take, I'll take a shot please. if that's okay. <laughs> um, I mean, I think, I think there's a couple of different uh, issues that come up. The first is a kind of complexity issue, which is given that we have different modules for different functions, what happens when you start to put them together? How do you have some ability to predict, which humans are notoriously bad at predicting these kinds of interactions, so how can we do so in a way that actually gives us some confidence about the reliability of the, of the system as a whole? But I would suggest there's also, I mean, there's a different sense in which, and I, I, I love the word models that, that Molly used, that, that I think sometimes we also need to think about what kind of model we want in the sense of, sorry to use a piece of philosophical jargon, but descriptive versus normative. That is to say, do we want models of how the world is or models of how the world should be? Right? So the recent uh, case of um, biased software for predicting recidivism, rate, uh, especially in Wisconsin, that is the, the re likelihood that you would be re that somebody would be rearrested, uh, which had a very significant, uh, the race of the defendant, of the, of the person coming up for parole, turned out to be a very significant factor in terms of what the system said was the likelihood of recidivism, of being rearrested. And in fact, it turns out that descriptively, the algorithm was probably right. If you are African American in the United States, you are more likely to be rearrested than if you are white. But we might also plausibly think that's due to structural racism, that's due to other kinds of factors, and that the world we want to live in is one in which we judge people, people's likelihood of being, uh, of reoffending on the basis of non-racial factors. Right, but that's to distinguish, that's, and so we sometimes talk about things like algorithmic bias or model bias. And part of the problem is that bias is a complicated thing. It depends on a standard, and that's a human activity. Right? So this comes back to, to Jeff's point about it's not just the machines by themselves, it's also the human machine. Right? So it's not just modules within the AI, it's the module of the human and the module of the AI. And so, the model of what data is collected. Absolutely. Which makes for, um, an interesting question, who makes those decisions? So in this particular case in Milwaukee, whoever was making those decisions, it was going to have a very profound implication, right? But um, I would argue that it's, it's the role of designers or human-centered designers also to take part 
in the decisions of what data is collected and how, um, and how um, that data is parsed. Um, I find, I've, I've been trying to at least teach our master's students about some of the considerations um, on these fronts because I think that those are the worlds our students are going to be graduating into and working in, given how many students that we have go into into tech or design in tech. So um, how do we do that, right? How can we figure out what those very human factors are and, and build them into the data collection and algorithm design process when many people don't actually have access to building and designing and curating algorithms? So how do we get the right people on board is one question that I have. I mean, I think to play off of that, one thing that I I have seen play out in, over a number of instances of data bias is that the initial reaction from kind of technology folks often is, oh, let's just remove the bias from the data. Because they hear examples like this where they're like, oh, well, of course that's a bad idea. We should remove race as one of the features that the model is learning from. Um, and maybe you can make some progress there. It's probably a good first step, right? Um, but it's actually really difficult to truly remove such bias. The, machine learning algorithms that we have, the reason why they are so effective is because they can pick up patterns that humans don't see. And maybe that pattern that they learn ends up recreating a variable that you took out. So maybe they're learning something that's a proxy for, say, race. Um, maybe it ends up learning some bias that we didn't even know the data has, or maybe even some weird bias that like the machine just kind of invented, right? And so kind of to get back to Molly's point here, you know, people should be involved, and I think I've, increasingly believe that the only way that people can truly be involved if, is if the models are open and to some degree the data is open. Now there's problems with opening data and maybe it's more like an auditing situation where people can kind of look at the data or whatever, but without doing that it seems almost impossible to make sure that these AI systems that are affecting us in so many different ways um, have any chance of, of reflecting our collective values, right? Because they're being developed mostly by corporations who have different incentives. Um, I'm not even saying bad incentives, just different incentives than maybe we would want as a society. And I, sorry, am I, am I allowed to? I don't want to usurp your, 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 your position. Um, this AI is you know, getting in the way. Um, I mean, I guess well, you know, in, in going with that, and, and here actually, I wanted to ask a question of Barry, if I'm allowed to, um, because I think one of the challenges that I find when I talk to people about these issues is precisely this sort of widespread belief that algorithms are objective, data is objective, and so maybe we collected it, you know, maybe we should have looked a little bit more, or we needed to, you know, just use just the right algorithm, but it's objective. You can't argue with numbers. This sort of attitude. And I'm wondering, you've done a lot of work using science fiction to teach, and I'm wondering, can we use science fiction about these kinds of, uh, whether it's the science fiction of Mary Shelley or the science fiction of today, to help people better understand that any kind of algorithm, computational technology, artificial technology, it, it is value laden. It's not objective, uh, even if the creator thought it was. Yeah, that, that's a really good point. And I think one of the key pieces of the Frankenstein story in your synopsis that you missed, uh, Rick, was the interaction between the monster, the, the creature, let's call it the creature, and Frankenstein very shortly after it was brought to life, the human element. Frankenstein didn't just flee the building and leave the creature. He fled, as you said, to his bedroom, but the creature found him. The creature came, parted the curtains of his bed, and smiled at him. The creature was longing for a relationship with the creator, but this particular creator couldn't handle that level of responsibility of interacting with something that was intended to be beautiful, but ended up badly. So that was the point at which Frankenstein leaves the building but the creature wanted to interact with his creation. And the, the human element, the, the bias in the data, um, we've got to consider things of that sort. Um, the valued ladenness, there is uh, something that has to be recognized. 
to make it one one concrete example, recently um, I was working with colleagues at uh, Microsoft Research, and we were trying to make a system that would label images on social media so that people who are blind um, would know what were in those images, right? And so there's all this great computer vision technology out there that can kind of do this, um, but they put it out there and they found that it often had errors, right? It's not perfect yet, um, but they found that the errors were kind of uh, weird. So uh, one example they found, it was a, a picture of Hillary Clinton at a rally last year, and the, um, the description that the algorithm produced for it was a man uh, doing a trick on a skateboard, right? <laughs> it's kind of weird, right? But um, what was even kind of more worrisome about that is that they then kind of brought in participants, and they had participants look at these, uh, look at these images or read the descriptions in context, and you know the participants found all kinds of reasons why you know that description would make sense. Why on a Hillary Clinton web page there would be a uh, image that's a young man on a skateboard, and it was something like you know the the descriptions were like, well, you know, she's trying to uh, you know pr pr present herself as kind of young and hip, and so there's a young man on a skateboard doing a trick or something, you know. Um, anyway, so. It turns out the reason why that kind of error happened in that particular case, but often happened, um, was that the creators of this system were really into sports, in particular skateboards. Um, and so a lot of the data ended up being skateboards, right? And so this isn't race or like sex or other things that we think of as common like sources of terrible society bias, right? But uh, it's somebody who likes sports and therefore influencing the data and screwing up and making people think that there's a image, it's not of the thing that it was. It's crazy. Well, that reminds me of the word to vec um, corpus, which is, it's derived from news, right? You would think that if it's derived from a bunch of Google News, that news is objective and, and it should be a good pairing for text analysis, or a, a good uh, corpus for text analysis. However, the word pairings ended up being something like, man is to doctor as woman is to nurse. So... Paris is to France as Tokyo is to Japan, but the jet, there were some really strong gender biases in the data. Um, and there is a group, I think it's Microsoft Research New England, um, one of Nancy Bame's students ended up working on this at a couple of institutions in Boston, and they set up a crowdsourcing platform to undo, or to, to basically test some of these biased pairings. And if they found that... Um, enough people on Mechanical Turk found the pairing to be biased, they would correct it and feed it back into the corpus. So they had a way to, to look at this. But other ways that this has played out recently, um, a particular data set was made out of restaurant reviews and started um, taking anything that was a Mexican restaurant and giving it a negative rating because the corpus it was trained on looked at sentiment in toward Mexico coming out of the news and build the wall, and therefore Mexican restaurants were viewed as bad. So it's, it's ridiculous and it's almost funny, but only almost, right? So following that, but not with Mexico, um, what you're, with the different biases, so let's try this another way. What about, well, we have a bias in terms of how we're programming, how we're designing artificial intelligence, any form of programming, the, the tasks it's being given. The models are, again, human-defined. So we have aesthetic bias already built in if we don't start going with ethnic, political, gender, which is also political. Um, what I'm wondering about is what do we have in terms of oversight? Science fiction, again and again, returns to this in biotechnology, in technology, even for that matter, xenobiology, looking at first contact with whatever other intelligences are out there. Humanities, the arts, drama are exploring these questions, often in very large, broad, overstated terms. Go back to, you know, Tyrannosaurus Rex and such. But professionally, how are we addressing this, this ethical need? Some aren't aware of it. Some work's already being done in several areas. Is the work being coordinated in any way? Let's start with that. There is work. How do you become aware of it in your fields? How do you contribute to it? Okay, I guess I'll, go. <laughs> I'll start from left to right. <laughs> Somebody's got to go, I guess. Um, so, no, I, you know, the, it, it's a hard problem. 
and it's a hard problem in part for, for a reason that Jeff mentioned earlier, which is that so much of this is done uh, behind closed doors. All right, so if you want to know what uh, is happening with you know, Uber and the, automated, and the autonomous vehicles, be prepared to sign a massive number of non-disclosure agreements so you can never talk about what you learned. Um, at the same time, uh, I think you know, there's a challenge, which is oftentimes the people who are developing the technology, uh, when I talk with them, the response is to say, look, I'm just building the technology. Somebody else is responsible for telling me what would be ethical or not for the system to do. Somebody else is responsible for saying, we went too far with this. My job is just to build the cool technology, which, you know, I mean, you can push back against that. All technology already has values in it. Even the Uber cars have to make a, de a decision was made by a designer. Should they drive as safely as possible or should they follow the law in every opportunity? Because those two goals come into conflict. You can't always do both, right? So they've already introduced values into it. But getting them to see that. And so that is often done through working with companies directly, working with the educational system, so trying to, to teach the next generation of designers, the next generation of technologists, to be aware of the human impacts and the human dimension of the technology they're building. Um, it means going out to policymakers and trying to get them to understand. There's a very good chance that the US Congress is going to pass a bill uh, that basically prohibits states from regulating autonomous vehicles basically says, we're gonna set the rules at the federal level and the states are not allowed to override us. And certainly municipalities can't. Uh, and you can guess what kind of rules are probably going to be put in place at the federal level. They're very permissive and uh, would put us all into a certain kind of, well, we're all already in an experiment that we didn't sign up for um, here in Pittsburgh, but it would do it on a much larger scale. Um, and so, you know, there's pushback there. There are people trying to lobby Congress. There are people trying to inform policymakers. And I think uh, it's, it's difficult because so much of it happens behind closed doors, but you, you know, you look for every opportunity, you take every opportunity and um, say, well, that's part of what we should be doing as academics, right? Part of our job is to help inform and educate uh, many different areas of society. So, uh, so I'm a runner, and um, speaking of the Uber example, for the longest time I'd been trying to like get up the nerve to just get hit by one of these Uber cars, because I thought like that's the way that I could like retire early. Um, but then I was talking to one of my friends who works at Uber, and he said, "Well, you know that would never work because there's all these sensors," and so that was pretty stupid. But um, I think that's kind of an example of kind of us getting distracted by uh, these problems that we can understand from the outside. So. A, a more real example is um, for the longest time, and even today, I feel like people are obsessed with um, how the self-driving cars are going to solve the trolley problem or variant, variants of the trolley problem. This is basically, you know, you can think of it in various ways, but it's basically, you know, do you kill the pedestrian or do you kill the person inside the car? And it's pretty much irrelevant to the real problems and the real dangers of these cars. <laughs> it, it came from philosophy, and I'm so sorry. <laughs> I appreciate I'm really that. sorry. I wish I could 101. take it back. I appreciate that. You know, <laughs> my profession. You know, first Barry told me that like machine learning and computer science are like way above physics, which I loved, and now you're telling me you apologize for philosophy. This is like the best panel. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, That's Molly. The future. <laughs> Were you adding something, Molly? Um, so I've been collecting cliches, and this is making me, I also collect sci-fi cliches of AI. Um, and at the beginning of a few talks I've given lately, I run through headlines that say, AI is the new UI, AI is the new electricity, data is the new oil. Um, you know, it's one thing after another. And everything from, you know, the robot sidekick number five in the movie uh, Short Circuit, which tells you how old I am. <laughs> I'm from the 70s and the 80s, um, to Hal, of course, and, and everything else. But I begin to wonder what it might be, and maybe I could ask Barry, what it might be to develop other visions of what AI looks like. Could we please get beyond the fembot? You know, like in movies like Ex Machina, which was, you know, a beautiful and jarring film that I have a lot of problems with. Are there, are there ways that we can start coming up with different imaginaries of this stuff so that we, I mean, or, or even different cliches? Can we invent them so we can begin as a society to think differently about 
what these possibilities are, what the restrictions might be, what the problems might be. If I understand what you're saying, I think there already are such things. And a couple of good examples are Bicentennial Man, uh, played, the lead character was played by Robin Williams, and Commander Data from Star Trek Absolutely. The Next Generation. Yeah. These are examples of AI entities that long to be human. It's sort of like the Pinocchio story. So it's a, a different take, not on the dangers of AI going badly wrong, but on the AI wanting to be like its creators. The measure of the man. The measure of the man, exactly. Yeah, yeah. famous yeah. Next Generation episode. Sure, sure. Where all of Data's hardware specifications are given, and we can compare them to what the human brain is really like, yeah. and are we there yet? And the answer is, Data wasn't even there yet in some regards, but we are there now, which I think was going back to what you were asking me originally, and it kind of took me by surprise. Yeah, the hardware is there. Um, the processor speed is there, and the storage capacity is kind of irrelevant because you don't any longer need to create a machine whose storage capacity in here matches the human brain. All you need is a Watson who is wirelessly connected to the internet, and you've got all of that information without having to store it locally. So I, I think we're there. What we have to worry about is whether a machine like that can ever do the thing that you said originally, launch a nuclear weapon without our authorization or something. So you lead me to the next question, actually, that starts with both of you. Part of this, well, part of the question would be, how are we limiting ourselves by trying to reimagine ourselves in technology? So the fembot or the mailbot. I'm you know, going in with that, but instead, you just triggered an idea that I see in terms of this, the idea of technologically augmenting society. This goes beyond the Uber. It's how are we limiting ourselves? How are we coming to depend on the internet, not as a form of intelligence, but as a mediated form of information and data? If we, if we create a data or any Android synthetic life form that is itself built into the cloud network, that will work on Earth, but where are its limits? Or for us, any of us who wander into a Faraday cage, well, you know, we're fine because it just shuts off our iPhone. Okay, maybe we're less fine, depends on who you are. <laughs> but any artificial intelligence that's tied into that pervasive network will lose its brain. So is this part of the planning? Is there a conscious? Can we consciously build in a plan for this, an ethical consciousness for this, that we aren't giving away the farm, but we're also not becoming too dependent. I kind of want to look back before I look forward. Um, and this speaks more to the first part of what you were asking. Um, in something like 1849, 1850, Dionysius Lardner wrote about the annihilation of time and space that railroads and the telegraph were bringing. You know, the two um, original piggybacked technologies of communication and, and physical physical transport. Um, and I think we keep talking about that annihilation of time and space and what it, what it means for how we process and, and get intelligence. He actually talks about intelligence coming in from the, or bringing intelligence to the barbaric countryside. Um, and plus, what a great name, Dionysius Lardner. Can we just pause on that for a second? Um, so this was a concern then, and we even repeat those terms now. We talk about the notion of human-computer symbiosis, but it was J.C.R. Licklider who coined that term in 1960. We use the Turing test, which is from 1950, um, and our notions, you know, you could look at Simon and Newell um, saying that their general problem solver in 1958 was going to have completely modeled the human brain by the early 1960s. I almost wonder sometimes if we come up with these models based on what we have at hand at the time, and it always pushes out there just a little bit further. Um, I guess when there is, are we all going to die because of a computer leashed attack or the singularity or um, super intelligence a la Nick Bostrom? That's a, a different kind of a, a nihilistic question, but, um, but I, I wonder if, 
we've got it now, and deep learning is a new model, and then we're going to have a new model, and then a new model, and it's going to be always just in front of us. Like, we're always already never quite there. Or I'm totally wrong, and we're in deep trouble. So, so one, of the, one of the things that, uh, that we find in psychology is a phenomenon that, uh, that many of us are used to, perhaps, which is um, the more you know, the, the more you know you don't know, right? That as you become more expert in something, you actually come to realize how little you know about something. And it seems like that's often the case with these, especially when we think about the nature of intelligence. That we, as we're developing better AI systems, we're learning more actually about what counts as an intelligent system and what do you need to be able to do and how much is being done by the human developer of the system such that we didn't notice it was being smuggled in to the system. And I think that that's often the case, is that uh, as we keep advancing the frontier, we, we've come to realize just how much further away the, the goal really is. I think that's absolutely right. I mean, I think we talk about, you know, will, when will the AI, you know, launch the nuclear uh, weapons? I mean, to some degree, right, like to the extent that AI is influencing and changing how we interact with all kinds of different socio-technical systems like social media, et cetera, AI is already having a huge impact on our politics and our politics could lead to nuclear war. I mean, this is uh, happening and it's happening in these little incremental pieces. You say, you know, we're never, it seems like we're never there. Well, you're never, you're never there until you get there, yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so it's hard to predict sometimes, right? <laughs> so I'm just wondering how all that well, I think one, one issue is that um, it, certainly technology has, has, I would argue, has accelerated um, this trend that dates back to, I don't know, at least Gutenberg, probably soon, earlier, of moving things from the head out into the world, right? So, uh, yes, we all joke about, oh, you go into a Faraday cage and, you know, it's like you've had a, a, a brain lesion because suddenly you don't remember anything. Um, on the other hand, that's what people said about diaries and notebooks, right? It, what would happen if you lost this notebook? Uh, and so, you know, I think one, one thing is this gradual, and it, is, it has been gradual, it's been by little pieces, but we've been able to move certain aspects of our minds out into the world and not always without, we haven't always thought about the consequences of that. What are the skills we've lost as humans, cognitive skills? Uh, I especially look at this with my, uh, sorry for those of you for whom this might be your age bracket, but I look at my 14-year-old daughter uh, who has a very different set of cognitive skills than I had at age 14, um, which is back in the days of short circuit, uh, <laughs> or actually, you know, a little before that. Um, and so it was, you know, it is really striking to see the impacts that are already happening and in an accelerated time frame. Um, you know, railroads and telegraph took a long time to build out. Uh, Google has taken 10 years, 15. Uh, and so you're seeing changes happen within generations, not just across them. I think that's a, a really fascinating challenge that we have that we didn't have before, is do we have the time to acclimate socially and individually to the changes that are happening? So recently I, I, I uh, read about um, Facebook's response to some people saying that maybe they should take some more responsibility for the various things that they're platform is enabling. Um, and I think, I think that their response, which I will, which I will try to, to be fair to, which was essentially they, they are trying to be neutral. They uh, realize that sometimes the platform can amplify and maybe accelerate to kind of build on this sort of comments. Um, but you know, they're trying to be neutral. But I, I, but I think that, that sometimes we, we don't realize that amplifying or accelerating is a type of action that has influence. And to the extent that we are choosing to amplify or accelerate, we're not, it's not as simple as saying that these were always human characteristics and now we're just amplified or accelerated. No, the amplified, accelerated version is different, right? Um, in a lot of different ways, and maybe some good ways, but it's different, right? And I don't know if that's always clear. So let me bring it back to science fiction since this may be our last question before we open it to Q&A to the crowd. Science fiction, most writers, most science fiction writers will say that they're not futurists. They're not trying to foretell the future. They're instead talking about contemporary problems, typically social problems. To me, this is an issue of engineering, but it's also design, and for many of you as faculty, 
It's how you present problems to your students or actually teach them how to recognize problems, how to, how to solve them. So with science fiction talking about today, turning this back to this idea of how do we forecast what we're doing to present a model for you? Are we looking at a change in cities where we have dedicated lanes for Ubers to cut down on the possibility of accidents? Are we then looking at the possibility of dedicated lanes for the answer or the descendant of the Roomba that you send out to go get your groceries because you're not going to pay for the Uber or whatever? I mean, where are we looking at a change in urban habitat, just to make it small focus for now, that is not just today, but is looking ahead at how technology is going to be evolving in the near term? Can you think of any whoops, science fiction that is doing this right now that's looking at that near cast without it being a cyberpunk dystopia, for instance? That's a little hard to say. Um, writers of science fiction imagine what the future might be like, but are they consciously predicting what the future will be? Um, probably not. I think a lot of stuff that was foreseen in science fiction that now is, I, I don't think that was the sci-fi writers deliberately, consciously saying this is what's going to happen. It is just as likely that it was scientists and technologists who were inspired by that thing who asked the question, wouldn't it be cool if I could actually do that? And then they do it. So it's more uh, an inspiration of things that could be. I'm not sure if I answered your question. You do, you do. Bring it back to the, you know, what we're looking at is science fiction and humanities become an inspiration. It talks about how we live or what it is to be human and to live as humans. So then how are we, how are the rest of you applying this when it comes to artificial intelligence or even just the design of human environments that are going to require automation and various autonomous tools? Well, I think one thing is is using it to try and figure out the kind of future we want. Uh, I think sometimes it's easy to think technology just kind of happens and then we have to react to it. And trying to think about to the extent that we can proactively influence technology, whether socially or as particular people building technology or as uh, consumers who help shape the decisions about what people are selling, uh, in terms of technology, I think trying to think about what is the future we want. There was, um, I don't know if any of you saw, I think it was uh, about nine days ago, I think it was a week ago Sunday in the New York Times, there was an op-ed from somebody complaining about this horrific future because she let her two-year-old play with Alexa. And, and it was just horrible because she introduced her two-year-old to Alexa and sh showed her two-year-old how to ask Alexa questions, you know, the, and then within three days, the, the two-year-old is asking Alexa questions like, should I wear the pink dress or the striped dress? And, oh no, I've lost control. I mean, this is the whole tenor of the, of the op-ed piece. And I sat there reading it going, no, you teach your child how to use it. Right, that's what parenting is. <laughs> parenting is, you don't just say, oh, what could I possibly have done differently? Well, what you could have done differently is taught your child how to responsibly use a technology. Um, sorry, that was my get on a soapbox because it was so <laughs> infuriating to read because it was positioned as this, look, we're starting down the slippery slope to a technological dystopia. And instead, it seemed to me, this is a case if you'd read any science fiction, you'd look and go, oh, we need to be educated. We need to teach the next generation how to use these technologies in order to proactively prevent this dystopia because we are actors too, we have agency, which I think we sometimes forget, but which science fiction, often some of the best science fiction, reveals all the little steps along the way where we could have done something differently, right? We could have stopped the dystopia if only. And I would hope that we could use that as inspiration to realize maybe right now there are things we should be doing to stop those little steps that, you know, someday are descendants, hopefully many, many generations in the future, are looking back saying, boy, if only. A good illustration of that might be uh, the recent movie, The Circle. Emma Watson is the lead character, and it's all about a technological corporation that is driving for total transparency, total revealing every detail of your life to everybody, and focus on the 
community rather than the individual. And Emma Watson dares to be an individual. She wants to do something by herself, even though there's incredible peer pressure to, why would you want to do that by yourself when you have all these colleagues who like to do that same thing? Why don't you want to do it with them? Humans need to be alone occasionally and not totally participating in community constantly, totally engaged through social media and everything. Uh, so she, she dares to be an individual and refuses to be absorbed into this connected collective. So that's a, perhaps an example of a step that can be taken to prevent assimilation into the technological future that uh, some people might prefer. Unless you have something more to add, I'll go ahead and turn it open to our audience for questions at this point. So, if you would. Please. I can bring the mic to you. Probably be easier. Bring the mic. Here on the Make it easier for us to hear. So, computers have already been trying to start nuclear war since 1979. All right. They, they keep giving us false alarms and saying that hundreds of missiles are currently coming here. But we, we always have had a person that, that then has to give confirmation. And, and then the, the person generally has a funny feeling in their gut or something. And they double check and then they find out, oh, I see. That wasn't actual missiles. That was a simulation program that was playing on the main machine. Um, yeah, that's, that, that's all, is that, yes, yes, computers are trying to start nuclear war, but what you do is, <laughs> it's all about what you tell the computers to do and how much power you give them. Hi, uh, going back to science fiction, a um, person of interest raised uh, a question for an artificial general intelligence that instead of uh, adapting a model to focus on education and autonomy. Uh, has that ever gained any traction in actual, uh, the real world academia? You mean the idea that, that if you really want to have uh, an intelligent system, what you do is in some sense uh, create a, a very, don't build very much in, but give it the ability to learn and then give it access to enormous amounts of data? Exactly. Instead of, instead of, um, modifying the data that comes in, uh, teach the system how to view data, how to define a problem space, how to act ethically. In various ways, that's been happening also since the 50s or 60s. Um, there's a little book called How to Solve It that was written in 1946 by, by George Polia. It's where um, a definition of heuristics was put in place. Heuristics is a rule of thumb, and they're provisional. Like, you probably have a bunch of heuristics for making a sandwich or for um, getting your car parked and getting to work, you know, a set of things. And sometimes you throw away the heuristics. They're provisional, you know. You throw them away when they're you've got better ones, right? So we've been doing that with computers and problem solving for a really long time. Um, we have the ability to do that better and faster now. There are gigantic data sets, and um, there's even the possibility for algorithms to teach algorithms how to make algorithms, right? So we see that speed up and take place. But I point out how to solve it because it's a wonderful short little book about solving math problems that actually inspired that very notion. And I mean, there is a there is a, a technique in machine learning, reinforcement learning, where the idea is that you do basically teach an algorithm how to solve a problem by it kind of flailing around aimlessly and you giving it a positive reward when it does something good and when it, a negative reward when it does something bad. I think the challenge for really doing this in the in the I mean, I, I think the the idea is you could start off with like a little machine that's like a little baby or something, and you could like you know teach it how to be human. Um, I think it's basically we don't have yet that machine. And there's a lot, a lot that would have to go into that, right? I mean, mm -hmm. um, our brains, we do learn a lot from when we're, you know, a baby to when we're uh, adults, at least some of us. Um, but, um, but, but that brain had been constructed over, you know, millions of years via evolution to even be, po for it to be even be possible to do that. And that's where I think we've not yet figured, figured it out, right? We've not yet figured out how to even construct the machinery to allow the the machine to learn in such a diverse types mm -hmm. of tasks, right? You could do it for a simple thing, 
And we do that, but that's reinforcement learning. Mm -hmm. Like that's kind of going back to these really narrow problems it works. But if you really wanted to do it like across both the uh, uh, go and uh, making dinner, um, it's super hard for lots of reasons, yeah. Okay, the, so uh, Hal stood for heuristic algorithm and logic. So right now we've got the algorithm. We don't have a machine that can decide which one of the three to use. Is that? Th that it? certainly is the case. I think also um, there's a challenge of knowing uh, not just which to use, but when it's okay to use one rather than another and what you're even trying to do in a situation, right? So uh, how do you decide what matters right now? Um, and this goes back to the, the comment about, uh, about uh, computers and who, a human making the decision. It is in part understanding the context and understanding that you might have multiple goals and you can't boil it down to just one in a moment. And so you as a human are trying to figure out how can I best achieve all the different ends I have, which change from moment to moment and context to context. Right now, we aren't good at that. I mean, that's one of the things that I think is maybe the, uh, one of the huge problems that we face in AI and machine learning is how to have systems that can, and I'll use a, a loaded word, but intelligently learn and change their own values. Uh, how do they figure out what matters? Uh, well, you know, we know how we do it with a certain kind of intelligence, namely kids. And it takes a really long time to teach them values, to teach them ethical standards. Uh, the developmental psychologist, Alison Gopnik, was giving a talk at an AI conference, and there were you know, 2,000 machine learning and robotics people in the audience. And she said, you know, I don't understand. All of you keep complaining about how hard it is to build artificial intelligence. And the thing is, intelligence is easy. You have fun, wait 18 years, and there you go. <laughs> And, um, and I think, you know, sometimes, you know, that, that, that's another avenue that I think is starting to be better appreciated now uh, is the importance of looking back at what we know about psychology and neuroscience to help inform the creation of sensible, uh, adaptable AI, and hopefully thereby ethical AI, we hope. Thank you. Uh, let, let's, let's assume for the moment that super intelligence is possible. 50 years from now, 100 years from now. Uh, let's just ignore the technological questions. What should, given all you know about humans, what kind of life should humans have? I find myself living in the house of the future, and it was built in 1890, and it's in Lawrenceville. And I find that I live in the city of the future, maybe more so than anyone else, but it was founded in 1787. And so I'm, I'm sometimes wondering if humans keep, keep doing humans. You know, we, we be the people that we are and have long been. Um, and, and that that's where we go. I do wonder if some of the future will look not quite so different where other elements will be un unrecognizable. Um, yeah, I find myself thinking in that way to kind of slow down the what are we going to do when it happens. But I've had this thought, <coughs> and I think it was something that you'd said, where um, if you think of the rise of fake news or what's gone on with Russia interfering in the US election by doing ad buys on Facebook, and uh, Google and using tweets and bots and influencing people, I sort of wonder if the super intelligence is, just, is going to do social hacking on humans and maybe not technological hacking on other things. It makes, the dark scenario makes me begin to think that that might be possible. <laughs> That's well, a scary thought. So this is, I would love to hear actually perspective on this because I'm worried about this as well. Um, so, so my biggest worry is what happens to, um, who has the value when, with, when and if AI takes over, right? Um, how does capital get distributed? I'm always really surprised you know, when I watch Star Trek that somehow um, Picard lives on this like, beautiful vineyard in France, but there's like all these people on Earth, like how did his family get to keep this when there's no money? <laughs> <laughs> We'll go ahead and take one last question, and then we have a uh, reception next door afterwards. Uh, hi. Uh, so this is, I like to call this the Blade Runner question. Um, so 
Uh, Blade Runner 2049 just came out, and my friend came back to me and, he, and told me that he didn't really, he liked it, but he didn't really like how it get, went through the same cliche of, oh, Android tries to become human um, and tries to f feel emotion and what it's like to actually be alive. Um, in you guys' opinions, um, what is a way that sci-fi can actually stray away from that cliche and actually make it so that androids try not to, like, that's not the only goal of an android is to feel alive. Like, what are other things that an android could feel and want, want to do? Homicidal rage. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because that's another common trope of what androids do. Um, I, I think part of the challenge is that... Uh, is that I think we don't know how to think about androids except as not quite humans. Um, I think, you know, we can, we have all of these, uh, you know, the, the, this word hasn't been used, but metaphor and analogy has been coming up in the background a lot of this, you know, data as oil, these kinds of things. And I think part of the problem is we don't know how to think about other life forms or other kinds of intelligences beyond human, uh, adult human, child, pet, right? So I can think of an android as being like my dog in some sense. Um, and I think we just, uh, we, we struggle to come up with analogies or metaphors. And um, I think some of the, the very best kinds of science fiction, whether in terms of uh, movies or books, are those that are really able to understand that the android of the future is unlikely to be any of the metaphors we've had, except in as much as we create them. And as Barry said, oftentimes the creation is inspired by what's already out there. Um, and I think that makes it, it makes it hard, but it also leads to some of the very best work is the ones where you realize um, actually the individual's not quite what you thought. Um, I actually think that's one of the virtues of the original Blade Runner is some of the characters are, some of the replicants aren't just trying to be human. They really are, seem to be something different. Can I add something to that? <clears throat> Nicholas Negroponte in 1971 wrote a book called um, the Architecture Machine, and he founded the Architecture Machine Group, which later became the MIT Media Lab. Um, and it's a wonderful, strange little book that's a theory of um, interfaces for artificial intelligence, basically. And um, he wrote in that book, it is so obvious that our interfaces, that is our bodies, are intimately related to learning and to how we learn, that one point of departure in artificial intelligence is to concentrate specifically on the interfaces. Then he goes on a little bit. And then he says, let me see if I can find the, the rest of it. At the end of the page, he says that there's this big initial question that remains unanswered. Does a machine have to possess a body like my own and be able to experience behaviors like my own in order to share in what we call intelligent behavior? While it may seem absurd, I believe the answer is yes. It, it might be, I, I found myself Return, I return to that quote probably about every three days right now. And um, in, in looking at this panel and in looking at, at Frankenstein, there seems to be something there too, because maybe Mary Shelley is viewing a terrible intelligence as something that has a body that grows reason and, and logic and, and emotion as a result. And maybe we do actually need models that have that much fidelity. I mean, maybe we do need replicants that fall in love um, in order for them to, to begin to understand us. I think we'll go ahead and cut it here. It's a very fruitful line of inquiry on this, especially what is the end result of what we build. But we're inviting you to join us for a reception for the next hour next door in the Danforth Lounge. Um, this is just the first of what will be five events over the next year. Next month, you may have seen some posters, we have a student film competition, and we'll be returning to a thread along these lines with a graduate student 3MT-inspired roundtable and competition in February. So stay tuned to the library channels and we'll let you know more about it. But for now, if you join me in thanking our panelists this evening. Thank you very much.